Okay, let's take a look at the overview of today's session. We are going to foster the skills to construct balanced chemical equations with state symbols for chemical reactions as well as ionic equations for chemical reactions. Okay, let's take a look at what is a chemical equation. A chemical equation summarizes what happens during a chemical reaction. For example, if we have reactant number one and reactant number two added together, these reactants over here are collectively known as reactants. And then you'll produce product one and two and they will be collectively known as products. Now let's take a look at what is the importance of writing balanced chemical equations. Balanced chemical equations with state symbols give very important information about chemistry. Number one, we will be able to know what are the reactants and products involved in the chemical reaction. Okay, we we'll also know the quantities of reactants reacting together and the amount of products produced. And number three, we will also know the physical states of the reactants and products. And this is very important actually in the chapter on mole calculation, such that we are able to tell what is the ratio of reactants and products that we have in the chemical reaction. Okay, there are some basic steps to write balanced chemical equations. Step number one is to write down the work equation for the chemical reaction. Step number two is to write down the unbalanced chemical equation with the appropriate chemical formulae for the reference products. Step number three, we need to balance the chemical equation by inspection of the number of atoms of each element on both sides of the equations. And then finally, we have a step number four, and that is to write the state symbol after each chemical formula. And this step is only required if the question requires you to do so. Let's have a quick recap on the state symbols. When we write S with a bracket, it actually means solid. When we write L with a bracket, it refers to liquid. If we write G with a bracket, implies gas and of course for AQ those will be for substances that are aqueous in nature. So there are some things that you need to be aware of during the balancing of chemical equations. Number one, you do not adjust the chemical formula of any substance and you do not change the subscripts of any chemical formula. For example, we have water, okay? And water has a chemical formula of H2O. When we balance our chemical equations, we do not try to change the chemical formula into such a way that we add a 2 to H2O. Because if you add a 2 to H2O as a subscript, it means that it's hydrogen peroxide and it's not water. So therefore, it is not the same at all. So these are things that you've got to be aware of during the balancing of chemical equations. Next thing that you need to take note of when you're balancing chemical equations is first, your atoms are not created or destroyed during the chemical reactions, which means if you have four of carbon at the beginning of the reaction, you, have, you should have four of carbon at the end of the reaction. The number that is at the front of a chemical formula actually multiplies every chemical symbol that follows it. For example, we have water and we have a 2 right in front of it. When we have a 2 right in front of it, what it means is that I have 2 of my water molecules. And that means I have 4 of my hydrogen atoms and 2 of my oxygen atoms. You actually multiply. So 2 multiplied by 2 at the bottom for hydrogen. 2 multiplied 
with your oxygen to give you two oxygen atoms. Now let us take a look at some examples of how we go about balancing equations. First example, we have gaseous propane with a chemical formula of C3H8 we should burn in excess oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. We need to write a balanced chemical equation with state symbols for this chemical reaction. First and foremost, we are dealing with gaseous propane. And propane is a flammable substance, which is also a fuel. The question says burn in excess oxygen. When it's burning excess in um, oxygen, it means that it is a complete combustion reaction so therefore the products that are formed are just carbon dioxide and water so first and foremost we need to write word equation so we have propane plus oxygen giving you carbon dioxide and water so this is carbon dioxide and this is water next step is to convert all our word equation into chemical equation that is unbalanced. So we transform our propane into the chemical formula of C3H8. Our oxygen over here has a chemical formula of O2. Our carbon dioxide gas has a chemical formula of CO2. And finally, we have water, which is denoted as H2O in the chemical formula. If we look at this unbalanced chemical equation, we can count the number of atoms that we have on the reactant. We can count the number of atoms that we have on the product side. So if you look at the reactants, and if we count the number of carbons, we have a total of three carbons on the reactant side. We have a total of eight hydrogen on the reactant side. And of course, we have two oxygen atoms on the reactant side. Let's take a look at the product site. Okay, for product site, we have one carbon, we have two hydrogens, and we have three oxygen atoms on the product site. Remember the rule that we got to have same number of atoms for both on the reactant site and product site. You can see from here that this equation is not balanced because the number of carbon atoms is not the same. For both the reactants and products, the number of hydrogen atoms are not the same either. The same applies to the number of oxygen atoms. Let's move on to the next part. This time, we try to balance the chemical equation. So what we do is, since I have three carbons on my reactant side, I'll try to balance my carbon for the product side by putting a tree. So if I put a tree over here, what happens is that I'll end up with having three carbons and I still have my two hydrogens. But in terms of oxygen, you see that this time on the product side is going to be different. I have three times of two oxygen for the carbon dioxide, so I have six. Plus another oxygen for water, I'll have a total of 7 oxygen. So by comparing the number of atoms for the various elements on the reactant side and the number of atoms for the various elements on the product side, we see that the carbon is now balanced but not for hydrogen and oxygen. So, so now my next attempt is to balance my hydrogen. So what I'm going to do now is I'll put the 4 over here so that I can try to balance my hydrogen. So when I put the 4, we see that this time I increase my number of hydrogen atoms to 8. But that also means that my oxygen atoms will also be changed on the product side. I have a total of 10 oxygen atoms on the product side. So when you take a look at this number of atoms on the reactants and product sites, I managed to balance the carbon, I managed to balance the hydrogen, 
but not for the oxygen. So I have to do one more step in order to try to balance the oxygen. So I can see that on my rectum side, I only have two oxygen, but my product side has 10 oxygen. So now I have to take a look at the rectum side to see how can I balance the number of oxygen atoms. So I'm going to put the 5 over here because if I put the 5, this will give me 10 oxygen atoms on the rectum side. And when you compare the number of carbons, number of hydrogen, and number of oxygen atoms on both the rectus and the product sites, you find that they are balanced. And that means I have a balanced equation. Since the question requires me to write down the state symbols for this chemical reaction, I am going to write down the state symbols. The question says that it's a gaseous propane. So it has to be in the gaseous form, so I have a state symbol of G. Oxygen is always in the gaseous form as well, so it is also having a state symbol of G. If you look at carbon dioxide gas, it also has a state symbol of G because it's a gas. But of course for water, it is a liquid, so it has a symbol of L. So this is the first example of how we write a balanced chemical equation. Let's move on to another example. This example over here says that we have sodium carbonate that reacts with nitric acid to form a salt, a carbon dioxide and water. You are to write a chemical equation with state symbols for this reaction. So the picture below actually shows how sodium carbonate looks like. Basically, it's a white solid. Nitric acid is actually in an aqueous form and then you actually add them together, you end up with your balanced chemical equation. Okay, one thing to take note is that sodium carbonate is a soluble substance, which means it can exist both in the solid form, it can also exist as in the aqueous form if they are dissolved in water because it's soluble. Alright, so what we do now is we actually write down the word equation as our first step. So we have sodium carbonate adding to nitric acid. The salt that will be formed will be called sodium nitrate. The gas that will be formed is carbon dioxide gas and we'll have water. Right, after writing down the word equation, we are now going to write the unbalanced chemical equation. So let's take a look at the unbalanced chemical equation. Sodium carbonate has a chemical formula of Na2CO3. Nitric acid has a chemical formula of HNO3. Sodium nitrate has a chemical formula of NaNO3. Carbon dioxide gas will simply be CO2 and water will be H2O. Now, we have to write down the number of atoms for each element on both the reactants and the product side. If you take a look at this balanced chemical equation, you'll be able to find that we have two sodium, one carbon, we have six oxygen, we have one hydrogen, and we have one nitrogen. But for the product side, we only have one sodium atom, one carbon atom, six oxygen atom, two hydrogen atom, one nitrogen atom. It is not a balanced equation because the number of atoms for each element is not the same on both the reactants and the product side. So we got to have the task of balancing it. So if we balance it, I'll try to balance the sodium to make sure they have the same number. And by doing that, I put a 2 in front of my sodium nitrate. If I put a 2 in front of my sodium nitrate, it means I'll have 2 times of my sodium on the product side. I'll have 2 times of my nitrogen on my product side. And I'll have 6 oxygen 
plus two more oxygen, I will have eight oxygen plus one more oxygen atom from the water, I'll end up with nine oxygen. So the things that are being changed would be the number of oxygen and the number of sodium as well as the number of nitrogen. Okay, so after writing a 2 in front of sodium nitrate, I find that, well, the equation is still not balanced. Now I have to do another thing to balance the equation. So what I do next is I see that the number of hydrogen is not the same. The number of nitrogen is not the same either. So I have to do something about it. The number of oxygen atoms is also not the same. So if you compare this oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen with this oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen on the product side, they are not the same. So we have to balance them out. So we have to take a look at what we can do on the reactant side. So what I do is I put the two in front of nitric acid. Because nitric acid contains your oxygen, your nitrogen, and your hydrogen atoms. Once I put the two, you can see that now I have two hydrogen which matches with the nitrogen atoms on the product side. I have two nitrogen atoms on the reactants which matches with the two nitrogen on the product side as well. And this time I have a total of nine oxygen atoms which also balances with the nine oxygen atoms on the product side. And then since all the atoms of all the elements on the reactants and the product sites are balanced, it means that I have successfully balanced the chemical equation. So what I do now is I'm going to write in the state symbols. Remember, I have mentioned that sodium carbonate can be soluble in water, making it an aqueous solution. So in this case, it's going to be aqueous, which is AQ. Nitric acid will always be in the aqueous form, reason being that it actually ionizes completely in the water to form your ions, which is your hydrogen ions and your nitric ions. So they are actually in aqueous in nature. Your sodium nitrate, being a nitrate, it can be soluble in water as well, so therefore it is aqueous in nature. Then my carbon dioxide gas has to be a gas, which is G. And, of course, my water will be L, representing that it's a liquid. So now I've written down the balanced chemical equation, as well as the relevant state symbols for it. Okay, so we have seen two examples in writing balanced chemical equations. Next thing that we are going to look at for today is how are we going to write an ionic equation. An ionic equation is an equation that involves ions in an aqueous solution. Okay, take note of that. It's actually ions in the aqueous solution. So only the ions form or change during the reaction are included in the reaction or the equation. And this equation will just show the ions that is responsible or that takes part in the chemical reaction. Some important notes to take note about ionic equations. Okay, only ionic compounds will dissolve in water will be able to dissociate completely into ions. Take for example, sodium chloride solution. So chloride is none other than the table salt that you have at home, in the kitchen, where we actually use it for our cooking of foods. This sodium chloride can be dissolved in water to form the sodium chloride aqueous solution. And this sodium chloride aqueous solution is actually made of, of sodium ions, which is in the aqueous form, plus your chloride ions, which is in the aqueous form when they dissolve in water. The next thing that also dissociates or ionizes completely into ions will be your strong acids and alkalis. 
Okay, take note of the word strong over here because only strong acids and alkalis are capable of dissociating completely into ions. For example, H2SO4. H2SO4 is the chemical formula for sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid is in the aqueous form because it can dissolve in water and dissociate completely into two of the H plus ions, which is the aqueous form, as well as your sulfate ions, which is also in the aqueous form. And you can see over here, for sulfuric acid, you have to balance the ions when you split them out. So you actually have two times of a H plus ions, but only one time of a SO4 two minus ions. Okay, some more things to take note about ionic equations. The formula of the ions that react, or sometimes it could change, are included in the ionic equations. Okay, there's something that you need to take note. However, if the formula of the ions do not react or change, we do not include them in the equations. They have a special name for this kind of ions, and these ions are called spectator ions. Okay, so these spectator ions are actually omitted on both sides of the equation, which means will be cancelled out from the reference side as well as the product side of the equation. That is what is meant by spectator ions. We shall take a look at what examples later on to understand in greater detail what spectator ions are and how we can get rid of them from the ionic equation. Okay, next thing that you need to take note is that any formula of solid, liquid and gases are always written in full. For example, we have calcium carbonate over here. Calcium carbonate cannot be dissolved in water. And since it cannot be dissolved in water, it is always in the solid form. If it is in the solid form, we do not write it in terms of the ions. The same applies to water. Water is in the liquid form. And because it is a liquid form, it is not dissolved in water, so we do not write as aqueous. Water is actually in the liquid state, not the aqueous state. Carbon dioxide gas over here does not dissolve in water either, okay, because it's a gas, so we call it as CO2 in the gaseous form. Okay, so like your chemical equations that we saw earlier on, ionic equations must also be balanced in terms of the number of atoms for each element and the total charges that are carried by the ions. So two things to balance, number of atoms and total charges. Let's take a look at different examples to further understand what is meant by number of atoms of each element and total charges. Okay, so if we look at the next thing about ionic equations, just like your balanced chemical equation, there are steps to actually follow in order to write the equation appropriately. So for ionic equations, first and foremost, in step one, you must write down the balanced chemical equation with state symbols for the reaction. So we have saw earlier on how to go about writing balanced chemical equations and how to put in the appropriate state symbols we actually use those steps to help us fulfill the step one over here by writing down the balanced chemical equation and state symbols. After we have written down the balanced chemical equation with state symbols, the next step is to write the formulae of the ions of those reactants and products which are aqueous only. Very important. Take note. Those are aqueous, then you write it in the ions. The next step is you must cancel the spectator ions on both sides of the equation. And once you have finished cancelling the spectator ions on both sides of the equation, the final step is for you to rewrite the equation without the spectator ions. Okay, so like what you saw earlier on with some more examples to illustrate these steps, the same applies to ionic equations. Let's look at some examples to better understand 
how can we fulfill those steps and those requirements? Next example over here is we need to balance the following ionic equation and write the state symbols. So this ionic equation is given in such a way that we have Cl2. Cl2 is actually a yellowish green gas, okay, which is actually poisonous. Okay, so it's actually chlorine gas. And we have I minus over here. I minus is actually iodide ion. Okay, it's an iodine, um, the ion that is derived from the iodine atom. On the right hand side under the products, we have Cl minus. Cl minus is actually the chloride ions that is derived from the chlorine atom. And of course, we have I2. Okay, I2 is actually iodine by itself. And then, in order to balance this ionic equation, the first thing that you need to do is to balance the number of atoms in each element. So if you look at this simple equation that is provided for us, you know that, well, we have two of my chlorine atoms over here. So obviously, I have to put a two over here to balance out the number of chlorine atoms. So I put a two in front of my chlorine chloride ions in order to balance the number of chlorine atoms. After balancing the number of chlorine atoms, the next stage is to balance the number of iodide iodine atoms. So over here, in the origin equation, I have two of my iodine. So therefore, I got to put a 2 in front of my iodine ion in order to balance the iodine atoms. So what I've done at this stage is I have balanced the number of atoms of each element. After balancing the number of atoms of each element, the next stage is to check on the charges, whether the charges are balanced or not. So if you look carefully at the charges that we have, for chlorine gas, being a molecule, it doesn't have any charge. It has a charge of zero. But for my iodine, um, iodide ion over here, sorry, the ion, I have a charge of minus one, but because there are two of them. So on the left hand side, I have two times of one minus. And therefore, the charge is two minus for the right hand side. Okay, so I have two minus over here. And then on the product side, I have two chloride ions, and each chloride ion has a charge of one minus. And since there are two of them, therefore the total charges will be two minus for the product side. And of course, for the iodine molecule over here, which is I2, being a molecule, it doesn't have any charges, so charges are zero. So are my charges balance on both the reactant side and the product side? The answer is yes in this case. So therefore, the total charges are balanced. I have two minus on the left hand side, I have two minus on the right hand side. So the total charges are balanced. And once I have the balanced equation, the next stage is to write in the state symbols. So in this case, I mentioned earlier on that Cl2 is actually a poisonous yellowish green gas. So it has to be in the gaseous form. And then the one that is in the ions. Remember, ions are only meant for aqueous solution. So therefore, it must be AQ for your iodide ions. The same applies to your chloride ions, which is also AQ. And finally, my iodine is actually in the solid form. Okay, Iodine is actually a crystal, a black purplish crystal. Okay, so it's actually in a solid form. And this picture over here actually shows you the reaction that it has. Basically, what happens is that chlorine gas is actually bubbled into a beaker of potassium iodide solution. So chlorine is actually more reactive than iodine. And because it is more reactive, it is going to displace iodine crystals out from the solution and therefore you actually have a color change as shown in the diagram 
when you actually have your purple crystals inside the solution. And this is actually your album crystals. Alright, and then in the aqueous form, you actually have the chloride ions in the aqueous form. So this is actually a displacement reaction with your halogen elements. Let's take a look at the next word example. The next word example is I have iron three oxide, which is a red brown solid. It reacts with dilute sulfur acid to form a brown solution of iron three sulfate and water. And you have to write an ionic equation for the reaction. So this picture over here actually shows the iron three oxide, which is a red brown solid. Iron tree oxide is none other than your rust that you see when iron products um, starts to oxidize in the environment, which gets rusty. So that rust has a chemical name of iron tree oxide. And this rust is able to react with an acid to form a solution. In this case, this particular solution is brown in color that contains iron tree ions. And sulfate ions. That is why it's in the solution form. So let's take a look at how we can actually write the ionic equation for this particular reaction. So first and foremost, we got to write a balanced chemical equation with the appropriate state symbols. Iron three oxide has a chemical formula of Fe three. And it's a solid. So I write the state symbol of solid. It reacts with sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And sulfuric acid is a strong acid and therefore it will ionize or dissociate completely in water, forming an aqueous solution. So therefore the state symbol for H2SO4 is AQ. It forms a brown solution. The word solution over here gives you a hint that is actually in the aqueous form. So therefore, I need to replace my iron tree sulfate with the chemical formula of Fe2SO4-3, which is written in the manner as shown, and then with water. And after writing down, we need to balance it. So in order to balance this equation, we need a tree in front of my sulfuric acid, we need a tree in front of water. So now I have a balanced chemical equation with state symbols. Now, in iron equation, you've got to look for those things that act in nature. I think the aqueous is actually your sulfuric acid and your iron tree sulfate, which are highlighted in red as shown. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up into its ions. So we need to write the formula of ions. Okay, I have two, three times of my sulfuric acid. So if I dissociate, one sulfuric acid will dissociate two hydrogen ions for me. But because I have three of them, I'll actually have six of my hydrogen ions. Then over here, you can see that sulfuric acid has one sulfate ion, but because it has a three in front, so therefore I have three sulfate ions. On my reactant side. Now looking at the product side, the only thing that is aqueous in nature on the product side is my iron tree sulfate. So if you look at iron tree sulfate over here, I have two times of my iron tree. Why? Because I have an Fe2. Okay, if you take note of this small little two, which is in a subscript position, it tells me that I have two of my iron tree ion also in the aqueous form and then I have SO4 SO4 is actually a sulfate ion sulfate ion with a bracket 3 out there in the subscript so what that means is that I have 3 of those sulfate ions in my solution so I have 3 times of my sulfate ions in my solution therefore it's AQ and of course I have my water okay you'll notice that my water and my iron 
oxide, iron three oxide are written in full without breaking down into any ions because they are not aqueous in nature. So only those that are aqueous in nature we break it down into a formula of the ions. Okay, next thing is we have to take a look at the equation. We have to identify those ions who are known as the spectator ions, which means they appear on both on the reference side as well as the product side. So you've got to omit them. So in this case, if you look at the entire equation, you find that the sulfate ions appears on both the reference side as well as the product side. So therefore, I'm going to cancel them away. So when I cancel the sulfate ions away, what I end up with is actually my Fe2O3, which is my iron trioxide, which is a solid ore, reacting with six times of my hydrogen ions, producing two times of my iron three ions plus my water. Okay, so when I cancel away these spectator ions right, right here, I end up with a balanced ionic equation as shown in this equation right here. So if you are encountering a question that requires you to write the ionic equation, you must remember to balance them first, cancel away the spectator ions, and then rewrite the equation again with the six symbols, of course. And this is the example of how we write the ionic equation. So let's do a quick recap on what we have covered for today. Okay, so first and foremost, regarding balanced chemical equations, what is so important about them is that they actually give important information about number one, your reactants and products that are involved in the chemical reaction. Number two, what are the quantities of reactants that react together and what is the amount of products that are produced? And number three, what are the physical states of the reactants and the products? And this is very important because in more calculation, you have to make use of a balanced chemical equation in your mole calculation because the mole ratio is based on your balanced chemical equation. Alright, we have four important steps in writing a balanced chemical equation. The first step is to write down the word equation for the reaction. The second step is replace all those word equations with your chemical formulae for each and every one of them and that will actually give you an unbalanced chemical equation that involves your reactants and your products. Step number three. You actually balance the chemical equation by the inspection of the number of atoms of each element on both sides of the equation. So you've got to identify the number of atoms of each element that you have on the right hand side as well as the number of atoms of each element on the product side. And then step number four is you've got to write down the state symbol after each chemical formula if you are required to do so. So these are the four steps that you have for the balancing of chemical equations. For ionic equation, what an ionic equation is about is an equation that involves just the ions in the aqueous solution. So only the ions that form or change are included in the reaction. And the ionic equation shows the ions that take part in the reaction. And remember, things that are not in the aqueous form, they must be written in full in an ionic equation. So again, in writing ionic equations, there are four steps. Step number one is to write down the balanced chemical equation with six symbols for the chemical reaction. Step number two 
you have to write down the formula of the ions for which vector sample product which are aqueous only take note of that it must be in the aqueous form then you write down in the formula of the ions those are not this you just write it in full step number three you have to cancel the spectator ions on both sides of the equation so what you see on the rectum side and what you see on the product side if they have the same ions, you actually cancel them away because those are not known as the spectator ions and they are not involved in the chemical reaction at all. And of course, the final step for writing of ionic equations is to rewrite it without the spectator ions and then you get your final ionic equation.